Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. There's well over 30 miles of trail. It's a great trail to come to. Feral hogs have proven to be a major problem uh, throughout Texas. Years ago, feral hogs were mainly in South Texas, along the coast, and in East Texas, but they're basically all across the state now. We love being able to teach history. We love being able to talk about history. And we also learn a lot by doing this. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. We usually just ride these. You know. yeah. Will Bloodworth and Guy Gray are members of a group called DORBA. DORBA is the Dallas Off-Road Bicycle Association. Today they're riding DORBA trails at Ray Roberts Lake State Park. And they're joined by another friend for a stretch. I had my dog Hattie with me and I actually hook her to uh, my seat post. I've come out here and done the whole eight miler with her before and this was the first day this year that's been cool enough for me to bring her. A little bit different, you don't see too many dogs out on the trail but it's fun to do. <laughs> with or without a dog, there are miles of trails to explore, north and south of the lake. There's multiple parks on the lake itself. With both Ile de Bois State Park and Johnson Branch State Park on Ray Roberts Lake, from the beginner to the expert, any type of biking that you'd like to do, Ray Roberts Lake State Park has it. We have everything from single track mountain bike trails to fairly wide concrete trails for walking and mountain biking and hiking. And then we have equestrian trails too. But for mountain bikers, the Dorba trails are the main attraction. It's great for all levels. Around uh, the lake is more of an intermediate terrain. Johnson Branch has uh, quite a bit of what we call flowy sections. It has a lot of switchback sections. It has roots and rocks and sand and open field. So you get a little bit of everything here. I love it. I think it's very challenging, and if you don't challenge yourself, you're not going to improve. You're always pushing yourself and trying to get better, and this trail will do that for you. I want another shot at that. That's how you get better, is just trying it until you get it done. A more leisurely pedal connects Ray Roberts Lake and the city of Denton. The 10-mile Greenbelt Trail follows the Elm Fork of the Trinity River. Jacob Knight and Brittany Kirkland like to hit the trail in tandem. Ready on three, one. We enjoy the tandem. I work at a bike shop, so I'm fortunate enough to come across some random things like that. And I got it for a good price, and we've enjoyed the heck out of it. Then and then, remember? You know, it's a really good way for us to ride and be able to talk at the same time. <laughs> When I'm on my own bike, I have to obviously watch where I'm going, but that's what I like about the tandem is I get to kind of take a seat back and just look and enjoy what's around me. Oh, yeah. I think one of the coolest parts about this trail is the wildlife that you get to see when you ride down the trail. I love being able to ride and pass a deer or an armadillo that's just like rooting around in the leaves and doesn't care that you're there. I think that's one of the neatest things about being out here. It's really close to home and you can kind of feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's just really beautiful out here. Uh, coast.
North Texas gets the reputation of being flat, but here at Ray Roberts Lake State Park, we have a mixture of everything. I live very close to other trails, 15, 20 minutes closer to them, but they're not as challenging. Uh, they're not as quiet, uh, so it's well worth the extra drive to come out here. People from Dallas, Fort Worth, just come on up. It's a great trail to come to. Okay, let's go. It's roundup time at Kerr Wildlife Management Area. Okay. Not for cattle, but for trapped barrel pigs. Hold back a little bit, just hold back. <laughs> Even though we're wildlife biologists and technicians, this is new for us. We're learning a lot from these pigs on how to handle them, and we're always upgrading our facilities. While these animals have descended from domestic livestock, today they are completely wild, which can make them a little dangerous. They almost always try to get away from us. However, they certainly can hurt you if they did charge you. We can both go in if you want. Yeah, let's go in. Okay. Corralling wild pigs is a risky and inexact science. Notice how close we stay to these fence poles. <laughs> but the science of feral pig control is what brings Justin Foster and crew here. The research that we're conducting here is an investigation of some pig toxicants for wild pigs, feral hogs. A toxic bait, successfully tested, could help keep feral pig populations Hippa. in check. Hippa! Hippa. Better find a tree. Hippa! It would certainly appear there's exponential growth going on. The fact that a humane pig pesticide is even being explored is a measure of the problems these animals pose, economically and ecologically. Here they go, going into the gate. Close it! Woo! <laughs> All right. Feral hogs have proven to be a major problem uh, throughout Texas. Years ago, feral hogs were mainly in South Texas, along the coast and in East Texas, but they're basically all across the state now. Texas Department of Agriculture estimates that pigs produce $52 million a year in agricultural damage alone. Those estimates go way higher than that whenever we start talking about all of the damage that is incurred annually. Uh, the impact is very significant. After a good rain, when it's nice and soft, they'll come out here and root it all up. These are pretty minor. Hog hunters like Philip Coger have seen it all. Once they do this, it turns the roots up and it doesn't grow back. Helping prevent damage to pastures, crops, and fences is part of the appeal for Philip. See where they've torn this fence up, coming through. Tear up your fence, then your cows get out, and then you got a whole nother situation. But pursuing pigs isn't just damage control. Stop them along here. The thing that's nice about hunting hogs is you can do it year round. They're good on the table. There's no bag limit, so it's not like you get one and you're done for the year. They're a worthy adversary. On this particular morning, the adversary remains hidden while plenty of deer take the bait. Wrong species. But by evening, in the pasture nearby, Philip sees a hog. Come on, take a shot. That's a dead hog. Philip estimates he has taken two to three dozen feral hogs from this property, one tipping the scales at 265 pounds. That's a big hog. They don't have any natural predators other than, uh, other than me. <laughs> that means farmers and ranchers need all the help they can get. They just want them gone. I've got about three or four other properties I hunt on with different owners and they all feel about the same way. A female can have three litters a year and if half of those are females, it gets exponential. They can do some serious damage overnight. Even dedicated hunters don't believe they alone can overcome the amazing ability of hogs to reproduce. <clears throat> they say there's two kinds of counties in Texas, those with a hog problem and those that are about to have a hog problem. And uh, Central Texas has a hog problem. It, it doesn't hurt, but we're not gonna eradicate them hunting them. Not with trapping or traditional hunting. 
although trapping can be successful on a, on a local level, uh, it doesn't really have very wide impacts. And that is why the research being done at the Kerr management area could be so important. Let's go pigs. Nationwide and internationally, there are lots of people working on this topic. And we are very optimistic. You ready for pig number two? Yes. When we put them in that pen. Send that one to pen 21. We're trying to work them as efficiently as we can uh, to reduce stress on the animals. Our technicians have come up with a way to work these hogs individually. The animals are separated into different research groups. He stays here. To identify them, some are also marked with a non-toxic paint. Yeah, X on that front one. It can be quite a rodeo at times. Ooh. Why? How about a why? <laughs> We're marking these hogs so that we can determine which hogs are at which feeder and for how long. <laughs> to Daniel's credit, it is kind of hard to paint them when they're fixing to snap your arm in two. <laughs> uh, let's go. <laughs> Whether it be a placebo bait or an actual toxic bait, the identification of those individual pigs helps us to explain the effect of our treatments. Right now we're entering into some taste trials, basically, to see if this is something that those hogs will readily eat. We have remote cameras set up, so as they come into those feeding areas, it, those cameras begin to take pictures. It allows us to get some sleep at night, but it also allows us to sample those pigs in more of a natural setting. There should be a strong correlation between the amount of time spent consuming the bait and a lethal effect. In many ways, the active ingredient being tested appears ideal. Intoxication by sodium nitrite would be considered clinically humane. There's not lots of vocalization, it's very rapid. Sublethal doses don't really appear to have any long-term effects. The ingredient is also inexpensive and harmless enough to humans to be used as a food preservative. But at high doses, it blocks the uptake of oxygen in the bloodstream to lethal effect. So finding a way to deliver it only to pigs is also part of the study. Target specific delivery is what we're trying to achieve whenever we're delivering a toxic bait. The hog hopper keys on the natural rooting behavior of the feral pig by using a vertical sliding door. At the same time, the weight of the door limit other non-target species from access. This project has lots of collaborators, the Texas Department of Agriculture, the USDA, our counterparts in Australia. The research continues with the hope that in years to come, it will provide a new means of controlling feral pigs more efficiently and affordably than ever. Trapping feral pigs consumes a lot of time. Flying a helicopter it is very expensive. That is the ultimate goal for private landowners, uh, resource managers, to have access to another tool in the toolbox. Regardless of research yeah. outcomes, yeah. hunters aren't likely to run out of landowners looking for help controlling wild hogs. The wild pig is certainly here to stay. So folks like Philip continue to do what they can, one hunt and one barbecue at a time. It's a lot more fun than going to the grocery store. <laughs> you always have lots of friends. Not so much when it comes time to clean them, but when it comes time to pull them off the smoker. <laughs> There's lots of people show up then. <laughs>
He's a student of history. We're all going to be called on at some point in our life to do things that we don't want to do but have to be done. If you know history, you know how people who came before you dealt with it. It's a, a road map. Road map for life. It's a road that has taken Charlie and his cannon across the country as he learns and teaches the lessons of our forefathers. This is a Mexican artillery uniform coatee, and I'm a second sergeant. That's what this epaulet is for, and there's only one of them. A first sergeant has two epaulets. So I'm studying very hard to get my second epaulet. Actors call themselves living historians. They've come to stage the Battle of San Jacinto, fought on these grounds in 1836. What we really need to do is. Charlie is here with his cannon team. We want the muzzle of the gun just past the bags. Okay. They've worked together as a unit for over a decade. We all have a little bit of ham in us, but we also love history. We love being able to teach history. We love being able to talk about history, and we also learn a lot by doing this. Viva Mexico! Right on it, Fuego! It's awfully fun. In fact, uh, it didn't quite go boom well enough this morning, so, so we changed out for better powder, and hopefully it'll go better boom this afternoon. Fuego! The medal here at San Jacinto would change the face of the United States. It was the turning point that led to the annexation of the Republic of Texas nine years later. And just three years after adding Texas, the U.S. acquired another half million acres in a treaty that ended the Mexican-American War. The country was now truly a continental power. And it all began on the morning of April 21st, 1836. Mexico's president, Santa Ana, and his army had come to put an end to the revolution for Texas independence. Fresh after the massacres at the Alamo and Goliad, Santa Ana and his soldiers marched in pursuit of Sam Houston and the Texan troops. The two forces met on the open fields of San Jacinto. The Mexican troops were relaxing, knowing they outnumbered the Texans by almost two to one. The afternoon attack by the smaller Texas army was unexpected, taking the Mexican army by surprise. 18 minutes later, the Mexicans were in disarray. The victory secured Texas independence. A century later, construction began on a massive project. It would take a workforce of 150 men three years to complete. And at 570 feet, the San Jacinto Monument is still the tallest of its kind in the world. This memorial is a testament to the sacrifices of all those who fought at San Jacinto. Not just the Texians, but the Mexican soldiers as well. Because no one back in 1836 could ever have envisioned how entwined our two cultures would ultimately become. Viva 
The Battle of San Jacinto lasted 18 minutes. The killing lasted for two hours. The Texan troops were beyond the control of their commanders. It was all of this pent up fear, rage. They were just angry and they weren't going to be denied. After the battle, there was about 600 prisoners. Many of those prisoners' descendants still live in this area. They didn't want to go back to Mexico. There was nothing for them back there. They went home with those Texans who fought here and worked on their plantation. Once the passion cooled, they were accepted into, into society. And that to me is just absolutely amazing. That's a, that's a neat thing. Uh, once we beat our swords into plowshares, well then we all got along. And that's something that's, that's gone on through Texas history is we've always found some way to get along. San Jacinto, the Alamo, Goliad, are all monuments to the lives of people who took the opportunity to start over because Texas was the land of the great second chance. They built it, we maintain it. And it's people like Charlie Yates who honor their story by keeping our history alive. And get to have those stop fellows and let them all stagger and go. Dig trade hole in the middle and in it put rods in the bow. Tackle boxes can be considered the tools of the trade for most fishermen. However, which type of box you choose really depends on you and it's really a personal preference. They come in all different sizes, styles and shapes, such as hard plastic boxes, clear plastic boxes and even canvas bags with individual compartments. Whichever bag you choose, you want to keep in mind a few simple tips to make it readily available and easy to grab next time you go fishing. For example, make sure that your tackle box is organized. It really helps to keep your terminal tackle separate and all your lures and everything in separate compartments so it's ready for you when you fish. You don't want to ever mix soft plastic lures with other plugs and other fishing equipment such as hooks because these soft plastic lures can ruin a good lure. If you mix colors on soft plastics, the colors can migrate from one lure to the other and ruin a good fishing lure. Besides keeping your box organized, another thing to keep in mind once you get back from your fishing trip is make sure that you air, your, air dry your box out thoroughly before you close it up. Especially if you're fishing in salt water, it's always a good idea to rinse off your, your fishing tackle and make sure your box is really dry. If you follow these few simple tips, the next time you go fishing, your tackle box will be ready too.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.